lights, camera, action. Today, we have the pleasure to have with us Julia Stiles, actress in over 44 feature films and projects and also 16 broadcast projects as well, one of which uh, was a, a directorial on the project Paloma, uh, where uh, Julia was a writer and uh, a director. Um, and uh, I first met uh, uh, Julia on a short film that she made called Raving back in 2007. Uh, I, I, I could not be more pleased than to have Julia Childs, Julia Stiles. I just, oh my God. <laughs> no, it happens all the time. Don't worry about it. Julia Stiles on Conversations with Charlie. Welcome, Julia. Thanks. It's so good to reconnect with you. And also, thanks for, I, I've actually never counted. Uh, the number of projects that I've worked on. So thanks for putting it in perspective for me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And and you know what? Inside there, which is kind of, I mean, it's 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 really fascinating because your your career has uh, a, a has a lot of sort of alternating beats, right? Because you start and you're a ghostwriter uh, in in a TV sense. I mean, obviously before that, we could pull all the way back to uh, 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 when you were uh, uh, studying uh, at, at La Mama or, or with the, what, was it the Ridge Theater? Tell me a little bit about that. Go back to the beginning and then we'll race around. Okay, I'm gonna go way back into the depths of my memory. Well, no, um, I was I born and raised in New York City. My mom's an artist. She had friends, still has friends who ran a theater company on the Lower East Side called Ridge Theater Company. And like the, her friend was the set decorator and painter. Uh oh, we just froze. Founder of this theater company. But it was a fringe group of um, actors and directors that uh, would do like two shows a year at La Mama and a theater called One Dream Theater, which doesn't exist anymore. I was on North Moore Street. Um, and so I was 12 years old and at a, like dinner with all these bohemians and i mean and my mom and uh and they said well we need a kid in this next show that we're doing do, it's like three lines do you want to do it and i was i jumped at the chance and then i became a member of the company and every year when they had a show i'd have slowly my my roles got bigger and bigger and then they hooked me up with an agent um and i started auditioning as a teenager you know after school for like movies and tv and then uh it got like bit parts here and there. I wasn't really great at commercials. Um, and then, you know, yeah, so Ghostwriter and then did a movie that Claire Danes starred in called I Love You, I Love You Not, where I didn't have any lines, but, you know, slowly started getting more work. And then uh, 17 years old, I screen flew out to LA and screen tested for a movie called 10 Things I Hate About You. And that I, changed my I, love. I actually, just as a refresher, I just watched it last night. Really? Oh my God. Yeah, I did. Wonderful. Oh. oh, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, I'm super, so proud to be part of that film and I can't believe that, I mean, I can, but I'm really pleased that, and people are talking about it 20 years later, like that's a dream for any actor just to get hired, but then to be hired in something that you really believe in and then to have people respond to it is really great. And sort of part of an, a, a somewhat odd trilogy of Shakespeare based stories. The Taming of the Shrew for that, Hamlet, an adaptation, and then, oh, later mm -hmm. on. But what was interesting, I mean, I loved watching uh, 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 the, 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 the 10 Things I Hate About You. I, I especially enjoyed the, not only the performances of, of all of the, the younger actors and Heath Ledger and, and everybody else, but, but also uh, Larry Miller. Yeah. Because I, I mean, I'm I'm a little bit of an older guy, but I remember in I was born in New York City on the Upper East Side, and when we were in our late teens, we would go to comedy clubs. We'd go to the comic strip and catch a rising star. This is like 1979, 80, that kind of thing. And I saw, and I saw Larry perform stand up back then. Wow! And he. As it as a teenager, you said, like, yeah. how cool is it growing up in New York City that you get to do stuff like that? Amazing, right? Yeah, I yeah. mean, and this is also the late 70s before there was a change drinking age. We were underage, don't get me wrong, 
but we were on the Upper East Side and it was a little rubbery. I mean, by the time things changed and the drinking age went up to 21, it got a little bit more tricky, but we used to frequent Catch a Rising Star and Comic Strip. And I used to see Larry Miller, Jerry Seinfeld, uh, 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 all the Joe Piscopo, all these comedians. Wow. Play. And Larry was, you know, just hilarious. So when I see him, I laugh, but he's playing a legitimately wonderful role as a, a, a paternal character in your film. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Funny. Yeah, he's he's hilarious. And he brought so much, he was just brought so much to that part and um, some great comic relief. But that's amazing that you got to see all those guys. Yeah. Where did you get your fake ID, by the way? It's not, it's not. <laughs> You know what? Back then, for some reason, they just let us in. Yeah. They just let us in. They didn't serve yeah. us the model, but they let us in. Later later on, when uh, people of the same age would attempt to enter into any establishment, that was not okay, except up at the York Bar in the 80s on York Avenue, because for some reason, the bartender there didn't care if you were 17. He didn't even look. But, but you know, it was that time when they allowed us to, to do... Uh, incorrect things before you had teenagers had to have like microchips implanted in them to no that doesn't happen but it's going to it's going to some in, in the not too distant future exactly exactly um apropos of that you're 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 a mom three three years old strummer three and a half three yeah. and a, almost three and a half yeah um yeah i am thank you uh for being patient with my un uh, un predictable schedule <laughs> well trust me i'm i'm a dad i mean my mine are 26 and 23 so uh, i i they they i have to sort of uh, uh, hope that they come to see me occasionally little enough interrupt me <laughs> right right and are they nearby in the, are they in new york yes my, my daughter lives in crown heights and um my son is finishing up university and living at home in the online education world, living with his mom out in Springfield, New Jersey, um, and uh, yeah, but I, I see them uh, uh, quite, you know, frequently back and forth when when available. They're both uh, they both have very busy lives, but wonderful. And how and the name uh, I, I love the name Strummer. Yes. Tell me, um, tell me more. I just, I mean, I, I go everywhere in this podcast. So, to, you know, we're going to also. Yeah, do. totally. Wait, here, hold one second. Yeah. Uh, so, drummer. Aha! Uh -huh. um, well, basically, I mean, I actually, I'm a huge fan of The Clash now. I was, I mean, I knew there were hits before. I wasn't, my husband was a big Clash fan. But when I, when we first started dating, I was living, um, in the East Village on Tompkins Square Park. And there's a bar called Niagara there. And outside that bar, there's a famous mural dedicated to Joe Strummer. And it says like, uh, history is unwritten, I think. Uh, so when we were dating in long distance and uh, we had just great memories of that mural and Tompkins Square Park. So we were thinking of musician names and, my husband came up with Strummer after Joe Strummer. And I, and then we also, it kind of just stuck. And it was the, the thing where we we're like, oh, it also means, you know, somebody who plays an instrument or plays a guitar. Um, and it started to sound like a real name. So that's, that's where it comes from. I love it. I love it. I love the clash. I mean, when I was a film student, I, 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 I uh, pirated one of uh, the, the memorable clash songs uh, uh, for the last moments of my thesis film that I directed. Uh, which was the film, Should I Stay or Should I Go? Yeah, there you go. They're, they're you know, and I'm not even really that into punk rock. They were very palatable punk, punk rock, but also they're, Joe Strummer was like such a interesting person. He was an activist and I think that's expressed in a lot of his music. And then he went on to be the, in the Mescaleros and he just, uh, you know, they have a lot of catchy tunes, but then they also just the, the message, even way back in, the 70s and 80s when they were popular, they, the message was um, a good one, you know, anti-establishment and very like socialist and egalitarian. So you got a chance to, to launch doing uh, 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 the, the, the first sort of big project. And then you, you went on from there and, 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 and it just started to roll after that. 
how did your career go? How did you, how were you able to, you just was just one after another or going independent and then large because it was a little while before the big, big, that was a big budget film right out of the gate actually early on with uh, 10 Things I Hate About You. Yeah, it was, it was, a, it was not a like typical, I think, trajectory for a career. I mean, I didn't know any of this at the time. I, I was just like, you know, I wanted to get work and I wanted to work on things that were interesting and meaningful to me. But um, I think now I've learned a lot more about thinking strategically about the industry. Um, but yeah, I, I do 10 Things I Hate About You. Then I enrolled at Columbia uh, University, but I took like a, what they would call a gap year. Like I took a year off before I actually started. Right and at that time I made a bunch of movies. Uh, Hamlet was one of them. Mm -hmm. Save the Last Dance was one of them. Um, so I worked that whole year. And then went, went started college when Save the Last Dance came out and my career, you know, the movies are released and my career, I started getting more recognition. Um, and then, yeah, I mean. And you went to Columbia to study English. You were, you were not there to study acting or be in a, in a part of the art school, correct? Or how, how did it? Right, I mean, the, the undergraduate, they don't, they don't even have an acting program, but um, I, you know, I, 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 I knew I wanted to go to school and I think there was a part of me that was like running away from becoming famous. Like I start, as I started, people started recognizing me on the street or your day-to-day -day life changes and you are more in demand, I think in the industry. And I didn't, there was a part of me that was like excited by it all, but also a little scared of it. So I think university allowed me to be in a kind of insulated bubble and also have my focus, like, you know, people, you see these stories of young actors and actresses who have a certain amount of success and they very quickly can become drug addicts or, mm -hmm. you know, crazy. So I think that university really helped me like keep my head on my shoulders because the focus when I, when I, I still had to do my homework, I still had to, you know, hand in those essays. And it seemed like I'm, I'm in school with people who are, going to become doctors or you know lawyers or politicians that uh hollywood wasn't the center of the universe in school which is but cool. it slowed i mean it slowed you know it took it it, it mean, meant that it slowed down my career in some ways um but i was very much looking forward to whether i knew it or not i was very much looking forward to well, my goal was to have a longer term career than just be like in a sprint if that makes sense mm -hmm. And the role that you you took on uh, with with uh, with Patrick in in uh, in Business of Strangers uh, with Stocker Channing, definitely a badass girl, you know, fantastic. And and am I would I am I correct in saying this sort of is a direction coming that has a certain thrust from Ten Things I Hate About You? It's a character that not that that's the same character, but it's a it's a it's a person with tremendous independence and, uh, and, 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 and sort of kind of a counter character to a more conservative person in this case, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I, the, the business of strangers was such an amazing script and an amazing part, but dark, right? And so Very you can see that my interest, even though I was 19 years old, my interest was in some of that darker, more challenging material. And, you know, I'm very grateful for all the sort of commercial opportunities that I've been given. But after 10 Things I Hate About You, I think there was a bit of a tug of war of like, the people in the industry want to hire you in rom-coms and here's this angsty 19 year old who wants to, you know, make movies about, uh, you know, assault. <laughs> I mean, essentially that's what that movie was about. Yeah, what it, yeah, yeah. And it was, but it was also, kind of uh i don't know it was sort of an anti-yuppie message to right the stalker channing character and uh there was like a there was a theme inside of that where you had the woman on the business trip you know and then and then and so it was a context theme too it was great you know and yeah yeah also the, the, the lots of gender issues you know you have these two powerful women uh and in in roles that we don't necessarily see women, or at that time we didn't see women portrayed as such. And yeah, challenging material, um, but, and, and dark certainly, but also, I mean, I was, 
and, may, and maybe slightly less commercial too, but that was what yeah. that was what was driving me creatively, you know. And also to work with Sucker Channing, who's a legend. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Amazing. She was great in that. Such a great film. I lo I loved seeing it when I saw it at Sundance, and and I I, I lost track of of uh, of Patrick. I don't know what happened to him after that, but that was uh, a, a great project to be in. And then after that. You, you you launched from that right into the first of the born franchise it's like a the next one up and boom yeah uh what a fluke that was the i had no idea it was going to be most of my adult life uh it's playing that role but how did but it start it started i distinctly remember being in my college dormitory uh, my agent sent me the sides. You weren't allowed to see the whole script. My agent sent me the sides and it was a couple scenes and I was stressed out thinking, well, if I go, and this, is how, this is so misguided. I was like, oh, but if I go and do this movie, then I have to quit school this semester and I won't get to finish my exams and I won't get the credits. Thank God, I, somebody talked me out of that. And, uh, and then I got on a plane to the Czech Republic and filmed a couple scenes and then you know, and it wasn't a really big part. Um, we also didn't know if there were going to be sequels and how the movie right. was going to do. And my character died in an original version of it. She was like Jason Bourne at the very end with Chris Cooper. He throws her up against the wall and I broke my neck. And then they, the magic of editing, they cut around that and Nikki Parsons got to survive for th three more films. Yeah, right through so, to, yeah, right through to Jason Bourne, the last one. This reminds me though, I feel like that, you know, whenever I do interviews or any actor does interviews and they talk about the trajectory of their career, there's a bit of deliberation. Like there's something deliberate at a certain point. Like I think more recently now, I'm much more deliberate about the choices that I make, but there's also, you're very much, so much is not in your control and you kind of just, it's so hokey, but like, you know, you're just walking in a path that somebody else carved. Uh, I, what I mean is that, you know, uh, uh, very often actors are not in control of their careers and, yeah. and the opportunities that come to them or the, and you don't never know how, you never know what's going to become of like a small movie like The Business of Strangers or a small role like the first one I had in, in Born. Right. And then if you, and then if you, then if you look at the, the, the jumping around that you were able to do, like in the middle of all that, you, you also had the chance to work with uh, uh, was uh, uh, David Mamet in, in state state in Maine, uh, uh, which which happened it happened before uh, Born Identity, but then later on you worked uh, uh, in, uh, as an actor in the theater in Oleana, correct in London. Yeah, yeah, I did three. Yeah, so I had always been a, a fan of David Mamet's writing not just his plays, but also he's written books on acting and books on directing. And uh, so I just thought, and, and, and then, yeah, he cast me in State and Maine, which was, I auditioned for it. Um, Earlier on, that was in 2000, I think, or something, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then did three different productions of Oleana. He didn't direct any of those, um, right. but, but uh, he's always gets approval over anything that happens. But yes, uh, Oleana in London with Aaron Eckhart and then many years later uh, in LA and then Broadway with, with Bill Pullman. Right. Um, amazing. Yeah, Wonderful. pretty amazing. And so you got a chance to do that. And then did you also get a chance to veer off to do, I think Shakespeare in the Park and, and, and some other theater, right? I mean, were you able to do other theater, right? Yeah, I was always drawn back to theater. That's how I started. Um, the Oleana was really the only Broadway show I did, but um, uh, I did Shakespeare in the Park. The funny thing, I look back on some of this, and I all I want, I totally want to do over on a lot of these experiences. Sure. Because you know, I mean, like Shakespeare in the Park in particular, um, I hadn't studied at Juilliard, so I hadn't really classically studied sh performing Shakespeare. I had read a lot of Shakespeare in school but never really studied how to perform it so yeah uh, yeah but, but still but still a great opportunity amazing experience right i mean and then you know with with mike newell and, and mona lisa smile what 
what what brought you into that? Because that was Revolution Studios. This is now a big studio. Now things are really stepping up. How did you get cast in that film? I auditioned for it, um, yeah. you know, and that's, but there's a thing, but there's a thing that happens when you do have a, 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 a somewhat of a body of work behind you, you're coming in at a different time in the audition process. So like, you're not going on a major, you know, cattle call, as they say, with a bazillion other people, you go in, they, the, they've been prepped, you know, and, and you have work to show also. So I did audition for it. Um, and I think the question came up of like, would I be more interested in playing a different role in that movie? And I actually really loved um, Joan. I think it was my character's name. Ugh, my memory. Uh, yes, Joan. I liked. Uh, I, I liked that part a lot because I. I don't know. It was something. There was something unexpected about it that appealed to me. And it was on that that you met our mutual friend Tas Mikos. Uh, I know. Time. And and but but it was not so much later that you you met your your husband on a film Breakaway, right? Um, we met on a movie called Blackway, and Black that Black was Blackway. Well, um, I think it was like I'm thinking Mona Lisa Smile. I was like 22, 23, and then yeah, no, it was ten years later that I met my Black husband. But... Yeah, yeah, but um, but your. Uh, Go back in time for me to to your mom and dad. I'm real curious. Your mother and your your mother's a potter, right? In the in the village, and your father was a teacher, but also worked with your mom. How did all that? How did you end up? No, this is why this is why Wikipedia and Google uh, is not always to be trusted. Um, no, I don't know why it's like he's listed. He I think he's he spent one year um, as a teacher in the New York City public school because I think he was. His mother was a teacher and I think he was feeling um, like he had he had quit a big corporate job and he was feeling like he wanted to do something more meaningful. Right. And then anyway, but that it didn't last very long. Um, he, he works with my mom. They have a business together and they've always I don't know how they do it because I think I, I like I would we would probably murder each other if my husband and I work too much together. We do work together sometimes. But anyway, they um, yeah, they've, they've run a business. She's had stores in Greenwich Village, in Tribeca, then they moved out of the city and uh, yeah, they work together. He does more of the like financial business side and she does more of the creative side. So right. and, works for them. And when you were growing up in, in the city, you, you went to the, you went to Friends? Where do you, you went to one of the, which you went to like a high school in New York and then, uh, and, and, and during high school, then you also transformed to another school while you were at Friends, you went on to a, a, another school that, and then, and then you obviously were studying or, or becoming an actress at the age of 11, right? I mean, you were very young when you started doing theater. So I, I went to PS3 um, in the village until- oh, PS3, right on Hudson Street, yeah. Yeah, hey, yeah, yeah. great school. Um, until middle school, then Friends Seminary. Uh, but, you know, as I was working with this theater company, it never really interrupted school. Like I would, it was always after, all the, all the other actors in it had their day jobs too, right? So it was kind of like, you know, we'd rehearse in, after school for me um, and have shows at night. And then I'd show up for pre-algebra the next morning. Um, but when I started working in, film which was really my junior senior year of high school friend seminary they were like we can't really have you missing so much school and they suggested i try pcs which is um you know it's called professional children's school it's you don't really study performing arts but you there were i was my peers were like uh ballerinas at new york city ballet or uh musicians studying at juilliard so you'd have like most of your they could accommodate a schedule if you needed to miss school or you know uh to work basically right so you were able to you were able to do both simultaneously go all the way through and then you took a break after you got out of high school before you went to columbia and you acted for a little while not that long. yeah i took a, a year off before i started college and then uh, uh basically right now you're you you've been uh you you have current project you have a project that's just finishing up right now the the orphan what is that the one that's in post so uh 
it's called Esther. Uh, well, I'll back up a little bit. I uh, I spent I spent the last four years working on a British TV show called, Ri um, Riviera. called Riviera. Riviera, yeah. And we finished our last season, season three, in March, just when the pandemic hit. Um, and it's oh, okay. It, it's it's hugely popular in the UK and Europe. It's not as well known, but I think an audience is growing for it here in the, in the United States. But um, it's it been an amazing wonderful experience for me um and then the pandemic hit and i was like okay i'm not going to be working for a long time probably and i was really reluctant to go back to work like just out of fear of how do you even how do you have a crew of people socially distancing that seemed impossible to me but uh i read this script for esther also by the way i was like i don't like horror movies i never watch them not my thing but i couldn't put it down and it was a really really well written script a uh, very talented director and a uh, really fun part for me. So I was like, sure, I'll do it. And it's a sequel to the movie Orphan. Oh, okay. Starring Isabel Furman. So that was, and Vera Farmiga was in the first um, movie. Wonder... But it's basically about a girl who, without giving too much away, a girl who, in the original, she's adopted by a family and then comes in and kind of destroys the family and tears it apart. And a similar thing happens in the sequel, although there is a big twist, which I can't give away. I understand, yeah, yeah. And that, so that, that was the recent work. Tell me a little bit about, because Riviera was uh, what, two, three years of work, right? Three seasons, so three, yeah, three years of work. Um, All shot in, in, in Monte Carlo, or where was that on location? The first two seasons were all in the south of France, which is like the title character of the show, French Riviera. Um, Monaco is a big character in it because there's a lot, it's all about wealthy people who, uh, the, the, the original premise behind it was behind every great fortune is a great crime. And so Monaco is a big part of it because that's a tax haven. So a lot of, it, it draws a lot of wealthy people who are trying to protect their money and um, all the criminality that surrounds that. The last, yeah. Yeah. the last season we filmed, they, we, this, the, the story opened up and we filmed in France, but we also filmed in Venice and we filmed in Argentina because my character found herself wrapped up in this conspiracy with um, an art of like a very corrupt Argentinian political family. It's fun, it's a conspiracy thriller. It was a great part for me and um, the, I'm proud of the show and I think I, I was really nice uh, that the um, producers and creators of the show gave me a lot of input. So by the time we did the third season, I got an executive producing credit because I had been so involved in the um, scripts. Wow. And, and I believe that your, your husband was on the crew, correct? So you were all over there as a family, right? It was very nice for our family too. Um, he, yeah, we had met, we were already, uh, I think even engaged by the time we did the first season, but he speaks French also. So having somebody that could kind of go between the British and the French crew was valuable. Um, yeah, but we were able to work together in that time, which is, has been, was great. And uh, you know, a lot of relationships really struggle, if you, especially if two people are in the industry and, and nomadic, it can be really challenging on any relationship to not, you know, you spend so much time on set that you basically, if you're not with your spouse, you're like living a completely different life. Yeah, yeah. And 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 was Strummer was was born in, in 2017? Is that right? So was mm -hmm. that after you wrapped or while you were still in? How did that go? When when did that? Uh, there was, you know, the British the British TV shows are funny because they don't go they go consecutively, but there's a huge there, at least between the first and the second season there was a huge gap. Um, there was like a year where the studio had to green, we had to wait till the first season came out, then the studio has to green light it. And then the, the, the writer's room have to come up with scripts. And we also seasonally really needed to be shooting in the summer. So there was a year in between the first two seasons and I managed to have a baby. <laughs> so um, I was just thinking Toss is funny because he um, he's such a lovely man, but I remember he texted me when I, I think he read that I had gotten married to a camera assistant and he said, you picked the right department. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because he's a DP, so. Oh, I know well, and I know 
uh, his life uh, as a DP very well. Uh, uh, we've 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 uh, uh, been uh, out on the road together and at an event that we both share every year in Poland, where we go to a cinematographer's festival called Cameron Maj. And yeah, so I've spent a lot of time with him, and I'm quite aware of his uh, his nomadic life as well. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, it's a challenge. Cinematographers, especially at his caliber, go all over the place. They're yeah. in South Africa. They're they're shooting in Europe. They're shooting in Asia. Anywhere, you know, they're just constantly traveling. And and on uh, and then so you were so this was so Riviera was three seasons. So it's sort of like a, a, it was a gig. It lasted a while, which is lovely, right? I mean, kind of during that period of time. Were there, was there time to fit other stuff in? How did you, how were you able to manage that? Probably not, right? Um, I did, yes, between the second and third season, there was, because we, we would only do like 13 and then 10 episodes, uh, it would be like half the year. So there was time in the other half of the year to do other things. I did uh, a movie, I did a movie called Hustlers uh, uh, between the second and third season. Amazing. Um, uh, with a lot of the New York crew that reminds me of Toss and reminds me of Mona Lisa Smile. And anyway, um, and then I did another movie called The God Committee, which actually is going to come out now this summer, I think in June. And that was a movie that got into the Tribeca Film Festival. And then the Tribeca Film Festival was canceled because of COVID. Um, yeah. So I'm glad it's finally coming out. But yeah, I mean, and then I look back on Riviera, especially because of the pandemic, and I think about, oh my God, what a gift that I was able to work with my family on three seasons, essentially four years of this show that took us to amazing places in the world that, you know, I mean, we were in, we were in filming in Buenos Aires, living in Buenos Aires for three months, March comes, we're hearing this like drumbeat of a global pandemic that is about to hit North America. And we finally wrap the show, get on like the last plane out and, uh, and then the world shuts down. So, you know, now, especially when travel is so restricted, I, I look back at that time on Riviera as what a gift that was. Amazing, wonderful, yeah. And, and, and what's also great right now in the, in the streaming world, uh, outside of the project that you did for this group, they're, they're, uh, Netflix is, is really centering itself in, in regions doing regional language content. So shows like Marseille with Gérard Depardieu or, or Call Lupin. My Have Lupin. you seen the show Dupin? Yeah. I haven't seen that yet, but I've seen uh, Marseille and I've seen Call My Agent, which in French is called Deep Poisson, which I love. Me too. And uh, great show, very funny, perfect. Very good show. Yeah. And, and it's great that, you know, there's so much stuff that's going on now. The world has opened up that way. What we worry about is, our uh, mourning for uh, 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 the opening of, of the theatrical experience, which, which from what I've heard, I, I could be wrong, I think this coming weekend or soon, the cinemas are opening here in New York. I mean, I, 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 I don't have absolute confirmation of this. I know in the suburbs they have, but uh, uh, the, the movie theater business has really uh, gone through pain. Everything's been... Yeah, but that's amazing if if that's true because I'm you know the, I'm not to go on this a long rant about the state of cinema, but you know there's a slow. Do you remember there was an article written a while ago, um, the the sky is falling, and it was about how streamers and and are taking over and like yeah. there's the future of going to actually see a uh, film in a theater is going to be dead because everybody's just going to have their own home entertainment system and doesn't want to deal with the public and. And so then if you have, that's true, you know, COVID makes it so that everybody is, is plowing through content at home. And I have to believe that there's still a part of us that wants to go back to the campfire. Same thing with theater, go back to the campfire and have a shared experience, you know? Yes, absolutely. And I, and I, I think the, the hunger is going to be huge. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, it, it, it's, it's a funny thing because, you know, before the pandemic, hit uh there were some battles that took place with the theaters um you know because uh the streamers didn't want to provide a 90-day window 
uh, so basically there was no exclusivity uh, for box office. And, uh, and I, I, I think that may still be the same. I'm hearing a friend of mine who used to be, uh, uh, well, my friend Ted Hope, who used to be the head of Amazon before that good machine and all kinds of other, this is that, all kinds of other stuff. I was talking with him the other day and he was describing to me some of the models that involve putting out a, a movie in, in, a, in a streaming uh, release and then pulling it and only making it available in the theaters, which I was like, wow, that's interesting. That's, a, that's turning day and date upside down, but something is gonna have to change because there has to be a reason why people need to have that desire to not just kick back at home too. But I think there is a reason. We're all isolated. We're stuck at our. We're all home. stuck at home. We're all stuck at home and cannot think, get out. Cannot like, yeah. Cannot get a, a a distraction and a diversion quickly enough. You know. Yeah, stir crazy. Is is uh, is your your uh, your your husband's world has been affected incredibly, of course, because of production and COVID and all that, but it's back a little bit now, right? It's back. You know, I think. I mean, I even went back and worked on Esther, and that was. Uh, you know, over, it was like a six week shoot, lots of COVID protocol, but I think the film industry has done, and, he, and my husband's working now, has, has been nonstop working since probably the, uh, last, wait, what month are we in? Last September, I guess. And there was a point in time when, you know, the industry shut down, but um, I think the, the film industry has done a really good job of figuring out how to stop the spread, so to speak, and keep people going back to work safely. It's expensive. I know it's like usually 25% of a budget, but yeah, um, there are six people on every on every production uh, minimum, uh, a COVID captain, a COVID advisor, four technicians. And then the testing, too. The testing is what saves us, because I know with Esther, uh, there were definitely times when everyone was, was obedient and wore masks and uh, washed their hands and tried to be as safe as possible. But you cannot socially distance on a film set at a certain point. And also, there were definitely days when we would be inside all day long and maybe there are extras. But there's a lot of people inside the thing. And whenever I would get nervous about that, the thing that always uh, calmed me down was that everybody in this room is getting tested three times a week, you know, so, so thoroughly that there's no way that anybody here has COVID. Um, and I think it's just, if you look at the numbers, like it's very, the, the film industry, most productions are able to either not have anyone get COVID, or if somebody does test positive, they can isolate them and and keep it under control. So there's hope for our industry. Yeah, there is. No, 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 it's definitely happening. I mean, I'm personally working on a few projects right now and there's stuff going on. It's definitely, uh, the things have, things have launched back. Um, I'm, I'm curious, I, we have to get into your uh, uh, experience as a, a, not only a director and a writer for the short film that you did raving, but also Paloma, which I know virtually nothing about, um, uh, but you wrote and directed a, 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 was it five episodes? What was it of, a, of the Paloma series, correct? Yeah, so- um, What happened and what's that? Tell me about that. John Abnett and Rodrigo Garcia um, created this right when, Streaming was getting big, but then also YouTube decided it was going to have channels and they were putting a lot of money into scripted content. So YouTube videos weren't just cat videos. They were like, we can put, we can put shows on YouTube. John Abnett and Rodrigo Garcia started this platform called Wigs, where they were going to, they had a soundstage and they were going to make a bunch of shows, short, shorter format, but a bunch of shows centered around women. So they would always, each show had, the criteria was each show had to be um, the title, the title would be the woman's name. And the only parameter was that you couldn't have exteriors because we're all filming on a, a soundstage. But Rodrigo approached me about being in one that he wrote and directed called Blue. Um, I did a season of that. I really enjoyed the experience, loved working with them. And in my conversations with them about doing a, another season of Blue, I said, okay, can I write and direct one? Not Blue, can I write and direct my own show? And when we say show, it's their, again, shorter formats. Um, so I, I, they said yes, and it was an amazing experience. And I did one quote unquote season, which was for, they, they changed the way they cut up, depending on the platform, they'll change, way, change the way they cut up the episodes, but it was like four episodes amounting to maybe 25 minutes, I think. 
then we did a, then we came back the next year and did another four episodes mm -hmm. which i'd call season two and then they sold it to hulu and it was it was broadcast on hulu for a while um but it was an amazing opportunity and experience for me and i loved i just loved uh, i always knew that my because of my experience as an actress, like I could handle a set and I could give notes to actors. But when I finally was able to get into an editing room, I thought, oh, okay, I get, I understand this now. And and by the way, thank you for your, on raving, you invited me into the post-production studio and you and Toss essentially gave me like a crash course in film school and editing. But I discovered in all those experiences, uh, something that really helped me as an actress too, which was, when you are in, when you see what an editor does, it just frees you up. Um, it frees you up so much in terms of not trying to control, like just gives you freedom in, 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 in performing. You don't have to try and control your performance so much as long as you trust your director and that they're gonna guide you and choose wisely. Like you can, editing can fix so much. So true. Yeah, you build the story. Yeah. You build the story and the way that you layer it sequence and find how the, the the how it all comes together and how it layers it's so important it's a collage well it's very important to understand what part of the puzzle you are like I, you, you know i think actors can can tend to get nervous and tense about making sure like if you have a remembering your lines if you have a speech to give it's like i got to get it all in one take well you don't actually you can stop and start again and the editor can cut around it or understanding what the director is seeing so that if they can't quite, com if you're ha they're having trouble communicating to you what they need, you can develop a shorthand where you go, you know, oh, I see the camera doesn't see that. Or, uh, you know, I, there are countless examples, but it's, um, it's important to see, I think through a director's eyes too, because um, yeah. I'm rambling, but I feel, but I feel like, you know, the, there's these stories of the method actors, which I think works in theater, but in film, like if you're, if you're so wrapped up, I love Daniel Day-Lewis and all of his performances, but if you're so wrapped up in your own head and you don't see what the camera, like the, from the director's perspective, what the camera is seeing or how they think they're going to cut the movie together, it's, it doesn't matter if you, you know, have been shooting heroin because you have to play heroin addicts. Do you know what I mean? I'm totally rambling, but you get it. No, no, but I, in the end of the day, the skill is both dialogue and visual storytelling and filmmaking, whether it's for broadcast or theatrical features is visual storytelling. And the best is where there's nothing being said and you're still getting something. You're getting, you're getting the detail of what's going on, knowing how to tell the story both. I mean, it's not that we're working with the idea that we work in, that we work with silent moments. But we work with, we work with images and transitions and dramatic moments that don't involve dialogue and also dramatic images that represent, right? Right, right. Well, another parallel example would be, I just started working on an animated series and that's all vocal, right? And the, and the director in it the other day when we were recording, it was, it was I think my first day and I was like, oh my God, I love this so much because you have to put everything into your voice. There's, and she's like, yes, I'm always telling people that I can't, if you raised your eyebrow, I can't hear that. Um, and it's, uh, and there's, and there's a similar, you know, with the visual medium of film and television, um, you can be feeling all the feels you want, but if the camera doesn't see it, it doesn't matter. Exactly, exactly. So um, when you, back when you approached me on raving tell me how that came how that story came about and what got you interested because i mean these are now and correct me if i'm wrong these are your your two directorial and writing moments right have you written mm -hmm. other stuff i don't know i just this is what no. i know not so yet when i have a feeling there's more coming I, but that, that's the next thing but but raving tell me how raving came about and, and also you cast uh, uh zoe deschanel and Bill Irwin, and they were fantastic. I watched it. I loved it. And and uh, and go ahead, tell me how that came about. And and you know what what prompted you? This is what two thousand and seven, I think, is when you came by and we you made that. It went to Tribeca, 
and uh, and and there it was. And and Tosh shot it. And tell me about that. How did it come about? Um, L magazine. There was a producer, um, Celine Rattray, in New York, who I knew, and she approached me and said, "Hey, L magazine is." has wants to fund short films and they they were doing like a series they think it's good advertising for the magazine it's good sponsorship all that so it's an opportunity for you to cut your teeth at directing do you want to get involved and i said yeah and then it was just a conversation with the magazine about well what do you want it to be about and i saw it as an opportunity to to get you know get someone to fund my short film basically but um but uh but uh you know, I worked with them in terms of like, what is the story going to be about? And they really wanted it to center around the idea was the dress that changed my life. And I was like, okay, but what if we like, I've, I ended up writing something because I wasn't a huge fashionista at that point. And I was like, well, how can I make how, what's my twist on that sentence? And so I wrote raving with the idea that this uh, uh, with the idea of grifters in New York, but then that this older man who is having trouble, is maybe almost senile, but it's, you slowly start to learn that he's not accepting his reality, like he's lost his job and he still goes and shows up to work every day. He develops a friendship with this young woman. Anyway, it's a, it's a, it, it centers around a dress that she wears, she finds in his house and he then confuses her with his deceased wife. Like he, he sees her in this dress and he starts having flashbacks and, and, and is reminded, he's confused. It was the dress of the ex-wife, am I wrong? Or you tell me, I don't know. I don't yeah, know. yeah, yeah, it was, it was, yeah. It was. yeah, yeah. Um, I'm surprised that you saw the whole thing because I feel like it's, I don't know where to, I, I don't have a reel or anything. I feel like I can't find it because it's it's chopped up on YouTube. I think it's in, because oh, it's a longer. Question. Oh, thank you. It's, uh, it's <laughs> yeah, like 20, it's at least 20 minutes, which is on the longer side for a short. Yeah, time, yeah, but... yeah, yeah, no, that's how I watched it. I watched it in three pieces. I, that's how they did it on YouTube. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Um, and then Toss, Toss was like, uh, I think I, I was around, it was on the heels of Mona Lisa Smile. And, right. and uh, Toss was like, anything you want, Julia, I'll do it. And I mean, he does, he does giant studio movies. So it was uh, really cool of him to be like, I'll make your short film. And also he was really cool to collaborate with because you know, there, there's, he was very respectful of my vision, but also very um, patient with, you know, teaching me more than I knew at that point. Yeah. Great guy, great, great guy. Yeah, yeah no, he is a great guy. And, and you know, in, in, my, in my world, going back when I was still with Tacticolor before I went out to kind of go out on my own in post-supervision, um, he was, oh, we lost you there for a second. Uh, oh wait! Hold yeah. on, hold on. Yeah, it. it, it but, 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 but. We need to just get the camera back. Okay, wait. Hold on. My uh, my my podcast producer will. There, there you are. Okay, sorry. There it's we in. Okay. So, <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Um, I, what was always wonderful and what was unique about Toss was that when you had. Uh, veteran cinematographers like like he is um uh you have uh craftsmen who are capable of guiding what the image will be uh from having shot on film photochemically having finished films photochemically and what we used to refer to back in the early days before digital finishing is get as making sure that your creative ideas were in the negative and then mm -hmm. what you left behind uh, uh, was what you intended. And you didn't have to do like crazy things to make that happen. And Toss was, uh, Toss was someone who was, uh, it was almost bulletproof. When his stuff came in, it was like, oh yeah, this is what he wanted. You kind of, you didn't have to go very far. Oh my God, I think about that experience and, and I've learned so much from it now on a practical level, but I, Toss was so game. We were running all, I mean, I wrote way too many locations in the script. So we were, we had a four day shoot. Uh, we were running all over the place. There were two magic hour shots that we had to race to get. So that's like 
two of our shooting days. Wow. Um, then there was also filming in a club and there was a sequence where she's dancing and there's like a strobe light. And he did this thing where he didn't have, to, we went into a club he didn't have to light practically. He, um, he had something like a flashlight or opened up the stop on the camera, I don't remember, but it was the coolest like kind of trippy sequence. And so he's very, from a studio background to like very, very imaginative, imaginative and artsy fartsy and was so game to like, um, you know, cram a lot into a four day shoot. Um, the other thing was that I was stupidly a purist uh, about, and I think that's why we came to Technicolor and talked to you. I was like, I was insisting on shooting on film, which mm -hmm. when you broadcast, I mean, I get it if it's gonna be projected, um, if it's gonna be projected in a theater, there is something really magical about the unpredictable, accidents, like the happy accidents, you know, with the great film grain or like hairs in the, you know, the, the, the shutter, you know, there is a primal thing that I love about film, but if it's ultimately going to be broadcast on YouTube or just on a computer screen, now I've come around to being like, okay, yeah, digital makes sense. But. Well, also digital has gone through tremendous advancements since 2007. Yeah. 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 <laughs> totally. Back, totally. Then, back then you could literally say if it was shot on film, you, you got a dynamic range that was really not available otherwise. Now, now right. it's, uh, I don't, I won't say it's the other way around, but you, you get pretty much everything you want digitally. Now you did another short, well, you did another two shorts, but you did another short that I haven't seen. And I, I don't think but these short films are not accessible. There should be like a, a short film channel. Someone should do this. They should, there should be. Yeah. Um, and there's a short that you did with Neil Labute called sexting. Oh my God, that's right. Tell I me about, about that. that. I didn't get it. You're going you're gonna to laugh. I tried to find it. And the only thing available is a trailer. But the trailer is pretty good because, you know, I don't have to tell you, you're the star. But the, the way it's done is it's a male point of view with a woman's face, basically like. Great. Right. Oh my God. I totally <laughs> forgot about that. The guy's head is the camera. Yeah. I mean, yes. I it that way, and he's basically getting, you know, somewhat ripped to shreds by by this woman who's facing him. And I and I I, I love what I saw. I like to see the whole thing. But tell me about that. Tell me about Neil Labute. How did that come about? I'm I'm you know listen. I go everywhere in my in my podcast. So this I'm, is an opportunity to talk about something that maybe doesn't always get spoken about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, uh, don't Google sexting because I'm not responsible for whatever comes up, but um, <laughs> <laughs> whatever spam comes out, not my fault. Um, Neil Labute wrote a monologue basically uh, for me. And, uh, and that's what it is. It's essentially me looking down the lens of the camera and talking into the camera. And I'm trying to remember, but I think the premise was that you know, in beautiful classic Neil Butte writing, this isn't revealed until later. Like you don't exactly know what's going on until I think if I remember correctly, it was that she essentially was like having an affair with a married man and then ultimately is gonna blackmail him about it. Or I don't remember to be honest, but it was a, essentially a monologue. Um, again, beautifully written. And we shot it in LA one day. Um, I had I had been, how did I meet Neil? I think there had been a few of his plays that I was going to be involved in that maybe never got up and running. Um, I think I auditioned for one in New York. I, did, I auditioned for one of his plays that ended up being on Broadway and Alison Pill ended up playing the, the part um, amazingly. She was brilliant, but that's how I met Neil and uh, kind of kept in touch with him. Um, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting little interesting short and interesting to do shorts, I would think, in, in, in your career. I mean, this is not like that long ago. We're talking 2010. It's after you did Raving. Well, also that that Neil Abu short was like a dream for any actor because it is a monologue. And, you know, normally like, yes, film is a visual image, a visual medium. So, you know, you're only a small part of it. But to be to have it just be a monologue is the it's really fun. Um, yeah. I understand you're a huge Mets fan. Well, 
Is that true or not? Or is this just is this just something that gets thrown out by uh, in publicity because I guess you threw a pitch out at one point or something? Um, it, it got seized on by the internet. I am a Mets fan, but I'm I would say like my dad says I'm a fan of baseball. So long-winded <laughs> answer. I a long time ago wore a Mets shirt to a premiere. Uh, before I had a stylist, and the, yeah, and and then I and then I and then so that became a thing, and then I got to throw out the pitch, the first pitch at a game, um, and I I was a huge Mets fan, I have to say, kind of shamefully, because I I've, I've been out of the United States so much in the last few years, it's hard to keep up with baseball, and then also these guys get traded all the time. My allegiance to one team is not that strong but yeah i mean i'm a mets fan yeah i'm a mets fan i mean you know but if you ask me if you ask me like statistics of even who no, no, what's going no, on no, now no, i wouldn't be able to I mean, tell it goes to generations i mean I, I i sort of started my life you know uh, having a direct subway line to yankee stadium from the upper east side so yankee stadium became sort of the destination for baseball for me some of it's geographical some of it's just out of memory uh, uh some of it's about where you were taken uh, uh, before you could go on your own, all that kind of stuff. Right, right. You know, I mean, baseball is a thing. I was, I was really into it in the Mike Piazza, Robin Ventura. That era. Uh, era. Um, but now, now it's just like, like I, I, I don't, I don't get into the rivalries so much too. Like I'll go see a Yankee game. I don't care, but not the Red Sox, but I, uh, I, for me, baseball is always like, I like listening to it on the radio and it kind of, it becomes kind of like Valium or like white noise to me. It's just, I like the art of baseball and I like the slowness of baseball, but, uh, I don't get into the, you know, the major rivalries, I guess. No, no, no. I understand that. And did you, as a, as a kid growing up, were you athletic? Mm -hmm. I was not very coordinated. I, uh, I wasn't, I didn't have much hand-eye coordination, so I was, I played soccer a lot um, all the way through college, but uh, oh. like basketball, I was not very good at. Uh, it, I, there's an indication that at some point, I, I mean, I, you know, of course I have to dive into all of the various elements of your life, but you, you, you did study dance as a younger person before, uh, it, alongside acting, I guess, right? Like ballet and then modern dance. Tell me a little bit about your life. My, my, my daughter's a modern dancer. She went to Bennington College. So I have, a, I have an affection for modern dance. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you understand that modern dance isn't just like blah, 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 interpretive willy nilly. It, there's well, actually like, certain types of modern dance. dance like Martha Graham or whatever is very technical and it's very rooted in. Yeah, Bennington, Bennington yeah. College. My daughter went to Bennington. She studied in the building named after Martha Graham and oh. uh, in a program that, that had foundations with Merce Cunningham and you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I did a little ballet as a child and a teenager, but I couldn't go on point. Uh, by the time that you had to like go on point, I kind of switched gears. And I, I studied with this um, modern dance teacher for children that Claire Danes also studied with, um, Ellen Robbins. And I think she's still teaching in Greenwich Village. But uh, so it was very like, oh, sorry. My batteries. Hold on, oh, my battery's dying. But um, uh, very technical in the beginning of the class and then the last half of the class is improvisational. Anyway, so that was a lot of my, and I did like summer courses at Alvin Ailey, but um, uh, yeah, I was nowhere near like gonna be a professional dancer. It was just more part of the artistic upbringing, I guess. Um, right, I mean, you know, I, 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 there's a, uh... There's there are all the components of of music, movement, and and theater, right? So that's yes. and movement is part of what you do in your life, in a sense, right? Yeah. So I mean, it's important. Uh, did you did you have was there any music in your household when you were growing up? Was there was that a big part of your life in terms of playing music or just uh, uh, obviously appreciating? You named your son. I love music so much, and I so wish that I had musical talent. Um, my growing up, not really, my mom played a lot of records and I always have very distinct memories of her, like cleaning the house, listening to Fleetwood Mac or listening to Talking Heads, even, um, Cyndi Lauper, Tina Turner, uh, 
so yeah, there. I mean, we've always listened to a lot of music, but nobody plays music in my family. Um, I took singing lessons for a while, off and on, like if I was in between jobs. Um, and now I said I've started this. Uh, I've started this animation job, and to me, it's like because I'm not a musician, it's the closest I'll ever get to having that experience of being in a recording studio and having to modulate your voice. I worked with a director, James Lapine, on a Broadway show uh, many years ago. And he said to me, he's like, you should take singing lessons because it will teach you to modulate your voice and control your voice more. Uh, and he was right. Interesting. And you've never had to, to sing in a role, right? That hasn't happened. Or have you? No, that actually, happened. What's that? It has not happened yet. Not um, happened. I mean, I'm not talking, I'm not like, I'm not going to be singing Frozen anytime soon. I'm not like a Broadway singer, but I can carry it too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so what, with your life in, in, in acting, you, you've been able to go roll to roll to roll. Are you, are you currently developing things that you're going to, to write and direct? Are you, are you going, you said you, you know, you, you know, not yet when I asked you the question, but is this, this is, uh, your, 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 this is something that you would like to do with your life or it's not that important and, 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 and doing what your career dedication has been is really the, the still very much the focus. So, I mean, I love acting and I feel like acting and directing kind of feed each other. I have been really wanting to direct something longer, a feature, um, and I've been actively looking for the right story. Well, first it was like just building up the courage to go like, actually, I, I think I can do this and I want to make that a priority. Then kind of trying to figure out what the right story would be. I think I found it. It's a little weird talking about it because we're, I, I am working on adapting a book and we have, I have a producer that I've worked with who's now on board to help me get it set up, but we're literally in the like contract phase and also the pitching phase of trying to get it set up with a financier or a streamer or something. So I can't really, I can't, I like if I talk to you in, if I talk to you in like, a month, two months, I could tell you what it is. But anyway, so yes, I'm, I'm hoping to direct a feature Wonderful. in the next year or so. And then also COVID is a problem. <laughs> so, and it's also like- It's a huge problem. It's the, the COVID of it all, but, um, COVID. but I'm working on it. Yeah. So um, for you, your, your life after uh, uh, things dropped was, it quieted down, but you worked several times up and through through the pandemic. I mean, you had the, speaking of COVID, you've been able to work during COVID and uh, life is life has moved on, which is great. Can you wind back for me, back to what you would call the, 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 the most important film you saw as a young person uh, uh, that inspired you to do what you would ultimately do? Oh yes, uh, Desperately Seeking Susan. Oh. Um, you know, that's not like at film school, they wouldn't say that that's the Godfather, you know, or, or Citizen Kane. But for me and my upbringing, I just, I, I saw it in the, I, this is the part of my personal history that I doesn't quite add up. And I, I don't know. So I distinctly remember going to, maybe it was my imagination, I don't know. And I do have an active imagination. I distinctly remember going to see that movie in the theater that is in the movie, which was Bleecker Street Cinema on like Bleecker and McDougal Street, I wanna say, which is now Kim's video mm -hmm. or was Kim's video. Um, but if that's true, the movie came out when I was four years old. So I don't imagine that my mother would have allowed me to see that movie. I don't know, I don't, I, I don't know, but. Well, it was, a, it was a repertory film. So it played in calendar theaters uh, uh, for years and years afterward, after that. After oh, that. thank you. There you go. So I must have I, seen I, it I, years I, after it came yeah, out. I, I worked, I mean, I worked a, a, as a projectionist when I was in my early 20s. And, you know, we would show exactly like that, something over and over and over again throughout the, you know, in, in different, once a year, a classic, right? I mean, that's one of them. It's one of many, right? You have Strangers in Paradise. You have Harold and Maude from Hal Ashby. The list goes on and on and on, right? So it was in that rotation, Blade Runner, whatever. You know, there was, a, there was a rotation of films that would go through calendar theaters. That was one of them, for sure. 
You yeah. just explained it. Okay, great. Now that makes sense. I must have seen it years after it came out. But anyway, it was, uh, you know, I just fell in love with Madonna and Rosanna Arquette in that movie. Um, and I thought it was, it was just so cool. And then throughout the years, re-watching it, it just doesn't get old. It's like the characters in that are so specific and so authentic and it's such a funny movie and charming. Uh, yeah, I just love it. Yeah. Yeah, it makes a difference to have certain films that provide a foundation. There's, do you feel that that there are aspects of the the kind of the badass Madonna character that you 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 felt in a kinship to in some way? Uh, I I like aspired. I mean, like most girls my age, I think we aspired to be as cool as her. Um, talk about visual medium too. Like the sequence when she's wearing. Uh, boxer shorts, suspenders, and like a wife beater, eating Cheetos. Oh no, she's, she jumps into, and, and stockings. She jumps into, oh yeah, she was wearing a garter belt. She jumps into the Jersey guy's swimming pool, swims across the pool, gets out, and then goes and sits down, puts her sunglasses on and eats a bunch of Cheetos. That is so vivid. You know, I don't, I mean, it's, 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 it was captivating to watch, but it was so vivid without saying anything. Right. Right. Means something. Yeah. It, it, impactful. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Um, so I feel that we, uh, uh, that we have uh, certainly a lot to look forward to after this is all said and done with, with the shutdown. And uh, I, I thank God. Uh, at some point, we'll, we'll we'll see cinema come back. This has been such a pleasure hanging out with you here and chatting and talking. And uh, um, I'm hoping we can do it again. Thank you so much for uh, joining me uh, today for this uh, conversation. Thank you. Such a pleasure reconnecting. And yeah, we'll stay. Thanks for yeah, we'll stay in touch. I'll let you know. Uh, how, well, and also you let me know how your projects are shaping up. But it's yeah, good to good to talk to you. Good to see you again. Thank you so much. Good seeing you. Bye. Thanks. Thank Stay you. safe. You too. Okay. Bye.